Good morning and welcome to Birding Basics. My name is Carolyn Knight and I am the Education and Outreach Specialist for the Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society. And today on Birding Basics, we're discussing seasonality in birding. Uh, what the seasons affect, some things that you as a birder should be looking out for, um, both while you are birding out in the field and to study up on when you're at home getting ready for your birding trips things to be aware of and to pay attention to so here in california particularly in the bay area our seasons are kind of iffy uh we've got rain we've got sun and then things are on fire and then we rinse and repeat uh but i have been assured that there are places, even here in California, um, and indeed, in fact, for the rest of the world, where seasons are actually things that you can define by weather patterns that change. Um, so seasons, depending on where you're at, uh, will differ on how obvious they are. Uh, for us here, it's kind of just something we mark off on the calendar, uh, but that doesn't hold true for our wildlife. And as birders, as people who are trying to learn more about nature um, and appreciate that nature to a greater degree, um, it behooves us to put a little bit of effort in to pay attention to those seasonal changes and what they mean for the animals that we're observing. So there's a lot of seasonal changes that happen, uh, many of them are driven not by dates on a calendar. Um, our birds aren't gonna be carrying around uh, a day planner with them. So it's not something that you can necessarily set your calendar by. You can't mark off, oh, well, uh, the house finches are going to be starting their their molts. They're gonna be getting more colorful on, you know, uh, February 27th. Uh, that's not something that's going to be ha able to happen. You're not going to be able to time to the exact day when the ducks are going to arrive on their winter migration. Uh, but it does give you a window of time to look for these things. Uh, and that can be really important. So you can nab your first of the season bird. So you can be aware of when the migratory arrivals are going to be coming through, uh, whether they're staying for the whole season or if they're just passing through for a couple of weeks. Uh, these are things that you're going to be wanting to pay attention to, and you can learn more about them um, by using some of the resources we've already talked about, things like eBird, your field guides, making use of websites and groups like your local Audubon Society, uh, like area-specific birding websites. So here in the, the Bay Area, in our county, uh, we've got the South Bay Birds. Um, you can look into local listservs that will give you alerts for when first of the season birds are moving through your area, uh, when rare birds are popping up and may only be there for a couple of days. So one of the first things I want to talk about in terms of seasonality is migration. Uh, and particularly seasonal migration. Um, so these are going to be migrations that happen throughout the year uh, as the seasons change, um, as weather changes, as photo periods change, so how much light is available during the day, um, as resources like food um, decline. Uh, these are all concerns that our birds have. It's not something that we as people necessarily are paying attention to in our day and age where we've got uh, central air, where we've got heated homes, where we have uh, grocery stores that have worldwide distribution so they can get us produce out of season. As people, that's the seasons aren't something that's going to really dramatically going to impact what we're doing, but for wildlife, uh, it plays an enormous role uh, in their lives, in their survival. So all sorts of animals migrate. Everything from fish, wildebeests, warblers, they migrate. Uh, they're moving with the seasons. As those food supplies dip, they're going to be moving on to new areas where they can find food. You can't survive if you don't have food to eat. Uh, so obviously, if the food runs out, they're going to be moving on. Now, once again, that's probably not something that you can set a calendar date to, but you can probably estimate when it's going to happen in a month or so. 
so that's something to be aware of. Now, one of the really cool things about migrations is we have something in North America called flyways. Now, these are marked out in colors here. Uh, we have the Pacific Flyway, the Central Flyway, the Mississippi, and the Atlantic Flyway. Here in California, we're in the middle of the Pacific Flyway, and this means that one of our biggest seasonal events is the winter migration, when we have hundreds of thousands of waterfowl, things like geese and ducks, coming in to our area to spend the winter in our wetlands. And these are wetlands in the Central Valley, uh, they're in the Bay Area, you can go further south and find the stopover points for these migrations. Um, but these are essentially, you can think of them as kind of uh, the bird equivalent of a highway system. Um, they're all going to be traveling down these pathways, uh, and they have stopover points. They've got rest stops where they can rest and refuel before moving on to their journey, or maybe they're going to spend that entire time at the rest stop. So, when we're paying attention to these migrations, um, we want to be paying attention not just to those general trends of, oh, the waterfowl are going to come in, but also species. And one of your best tools for that is, once again, your field guide. So I mentioned the range maps before. Uh, on the Nat Geo books that are on this side right by the species accounts. But you'll notice that there are different colors on these maps. And these colors correspond with the times of the year. Now this differs for every field guide, uh, but as a general rule, blue means winter, so that's going to be the range that bird is found in uh, during the winter seasons. Uh, red, pink, orangish generally means summer. Uh, yellow tends to be the migration pathways, so they're going to be in that area passing through between the seasons. Uh, but your field guides are going to give you an actual breakdown of these. So it'll tell you what each of these colors mean, if there are dotted lines, what those are going to tell you. Uh, so once again, um, going back to our equipment video, um, it really does pay to spend some quality time with your field guide when you're not out birding. Uh, read the introduction, flip through the indexes, uh, just familiarize yourself with all of the tools that are available in these guides uh, beyond just the fact that it's, it's you know, um, really heavy and has lots of pretty pictures in it. Um, <laughs> but when we're looking at these field guides, um, I also want to point out that one of your best friends is going to be the wonderful internet. Um, it's going to have far more up-to-date information for you in terms of what's in your area on a daily, weekly, monthly basis, um, and you can in fact set up things to give you alerts for when first of the season birds are coming through. Um, so you can really keep track of those birds um, and get you're birding to a level where you're feeling comfortable, that you're seeing as much as you want to. Uh, not necessarily as much as you can. Uh, many of us aren't willing to go chasing through the county after birds. Um, we may just want to be a little bit more local in it. Um, just appreciate the birds that are coming to us, uh, particularly now when travel is, is not recommended. Um, but it's an excellent tool to be aware of, uh, to keep track of, and to notice that even though every day for us kind of seems the same, uh, changes are happening with the wider world. And that also means that the birds that we're seeing are also going to be changing. Um, so the migration is important to pay attention to because it's going to give you information on what birds are actually present in your area. And as I mentioned, Sometimes you're just going to have birds that pass through. You've got a really limited window um, in order to see them. So if you do want to add them to your list for the year, if you do want to be able to see them, uh, you do have to pay attention to those seasons. Um, some species will spend an entire season with you. You may have uh, northern pintails with you all winter, but they'll move on. 
they'll go back north for the summer for their breeding season uh, back up into Canada. So if you do want to be an effective birder, you don't want to miss out on those birds, uh, you do have to put that effort in to actually do that research and pay attention to those seasonal changes that are kind of just getting marked off on your calendar as you go through your day-to-day -day life. But what birds are here um, aren't the only changes that happen with the seasons. In fact, our residential birds can undergo some really dramatic changes, and one of the best ones, or at least my favorite ones for this, is our friend the great egret. So, our great egret is a residential bird for the Bay Area. We've got them all year round. You're going to see them in the wetlands. You're going to see them at the local reservoirs and ponds and creeks. Uh, you can even find them in the hills, in the fields, hunting for things like gophers with their gigantic beaks. Uh, but this is a really cool bird because while it's always pretty, it's a really graceful looking animal, it's entirely white, um, during the spring, they undergo some pretty cool changes um, that actually um, almost led to their extinction. So in this picture here, um, you can see that it's actually got plumes coming out of its back, and it's spread sort of like a peacock. And these plumes are only present during the breeding season. Both the males and the females will grow them. Um, and it used to be the fashion uh, particularly in women's fashion, to wear feathers in your hats, or sometimes even entire stuffed birds, and I've, I've been told that taxidermy is no longer quite that fashionable. I'm not entirely sure I believe it, but... Um, <sighs> these plumes almost led to the extinction of these birds. They only grow them in the breeding season, and they're communal nesters. So you're not just going to find one great egret with these plumes, or two great egrets on a nest, you're going to find possibly hundreds of them together with these plumes that at the time were incredibly valuable. And in fact, the National Audubon Society was founded in order to protect these birds. A group of women got together and decided that rather than see these birds on hats, they would prefer to see them alive. But that's not the only seasonal change that these birds undergo. Um, if you take a close look, you can actually see that these guys actually have bright green right in front of their eyes, between their beak and their eyes. Now, during the rest of the year, that skin is yellow, but as they enter the breeding season, uh, their hormones change, and it causes a vibrant green coloration to take over that skin. Um, so you can always tell when our great egrets are ready for the breeding season. Uh, they've got bright green eyeliner on, and they are flashing those plumes for everybody to see. Now, that does bring us to another seasonal change uh, with the appearance of our birds, uh, and that is molt. Now, molting is the loss and regrowth of feathers throughout a year. A bird, obviously, is going to have its feathers worn down as it goes through its day-to-day -day life. Uh, things like weather conditions, interactions with other birds, just flying. Uh, moving through vegetation, all of these can damage and wear down feathers. And feathers are incredibly important to the survival of birds. Uh, they keep them warm, they help them camouflage, they help them communicate with other birds, they allow them to fly, they keep them dry. So a bird with damaged feathers isn't necessarily on top of its game. It's going to be severely handicapped in its everyday life. So. A lot of our birds, uh, including things like our red-tailed hawk, are going to undergo one complete molt in a year. Uh, but that doesn't hold true for all of our birds, and in fact, some of our more colorful birds, uh, like our lazuli bunting, which has arrived in South County right now, it is up in the hills. Uh, so if you're taking a look at this little dude and saying, how is it possible that we have a bird that is this brightly colored? Um, it looks like it should be found in the tropics. Um, they're here, but uh, they're only here for part of the year. And these guys will go through one complete molt where they replace all their feathers, they're good to fly, and then right before the breeding season hits, they'll go through a partial molt where they're replacing all of these really bright colors. Um, they don't want to be exceptionally brightly colored 
all year round. That's essentially wearing a target. And when you're a little tiny songbird, uh, you've got a lot of predators uh, that are going to be on the lookout for you. So you don't want to be wearing that giant neon sign that says, Hi, I'm a bird right over here. I'm delicious and easy to find. So the lazuli buntings aren't going to be staying in that bright coloration all year round. And then some birds, which live in really punishing habitats, like our marsh wren, uh, where it's in and out of soft-used reeds and grasses, it's darting around in the really thick undergrowth, um, they'll actually go through two complete molts throughout a year. So it does depend on the species. It depends on the habitat, where they're living, what the environment they're interacting with is. Uh, but you should notice that and pay attention to the fact that birds' feathers are going to be replaced and that can impact what they look like. It can impact what you're looking for. If you are looking for, say for example, a lesser goldfinch and it's in the middle of winter, you shouldn't be looking for a bird that has a bright yellow chest. It's just it's still going to be yellow, but it's not going to be the color of a lemon. Uh, it's going to be a little bit more subtle than that. And if you're not aware of that, you may miss the species that are still present in your area, uh, but are simply wearing maybe a little bit more subdued coat. And now, molting has a whole bunch of nomenclature associated with it. As a birder, you can pretty much get away with just saying winter or non-breeding plumage or summer and breeding plumage. Uh, the summer plumage tends to be more colorful because that is when they are trying to attract the attention of a mate. Uh, but if you're going into scientific terms, you're going to get see things like basic plumage, which is the feathers that a bird is in for the majority of the year. Uh, if you're talking about something like a goldfinch, um, it's going to be the drabber feathers. But if you're talking about something like a duck, its basic plumage, particularly a male duck, is going to be brighter than its alternate plumage, which is the plumage they spend a smaller portion of the year in. If you're just birding, you probably don't need to go into those details. Now if you're doing something like banding, uh, that is a whole different nomenclature that there are literal books on that um, I recommend you look into. Uh, but with your banding, you're looking at a bird in far more detail than even the best birder is necessarily going to care about. Uh, you're going to be looking at individual feathers on that bird that you're holding in your hand. And if you're a birder, you're not going to be touching the birds, and that is key to remember. Um, but beyond what birds are present and what they're looking like, uh, you should also be paying attention to the seasonal changes that happen with the behavior of birds. And one of the best examples for this is something called the dawn chorus. Uh, now, we are well into spring at this point, but at the start of spring, that is when this tends to begin. Um, it's going to be... If you wake up early, you tend to notice this more, uh, but say 6 a.m., the sun isn't quite up because we're at the start of spring, you'll notice that the birds are already singing. They're singing very loudly, um, and it may in fact be what's waking you up. And the reason they're singing is because of that seasonal change. Suddenly our birds are vying for territory. They are looking to attract a mate they're trying to contact their flocks, and because of this, they are loud, they are calling, they are singing, they're trying to attract attention. But if you're not in spring, if you're maybe in fall, where we're looking at September, November, you're going to notice that those birds aren't nearly as vocal. Uh, you'll still hear bird calls but they'll be more concerned with contacting their flocks and things like warning about predators. And those calls aren't nearly as complicated. They're not nearly as dramatic. Uh, they're harder to pick out uh, because they're not trying to attract attention. They're more concerned with just getting through the fall, finding food, maybe getting ready for their migration, where they're going to need lots of energy, and, of course, avoiding predators. So seasons 
even if we as people aren't impacted to a degree where we're just like, oh, we have to plan for the winter. We have to make sure we've got all of this food. We need to make sure we have proper shelter. Um, they have a major impact in the wildlife that we are observing. And it does behoove us as naturalists, as enthusiasts of birds and people who care about the birds and learning more about them, that we pay attention to these seasonal changes. So the bird I want to talk to you guys about today is a residential bird. You're not going to be seeing this guy migrate. And in fact, it doesn't go through very dramatic plumage changes with its molts. But it is one that I hope everybody is going to recognize. Uh, and that is our morning dove. Now, this little guy is our, our drab little dove. You'll see it poking around in gardens, in parks, in the cities. And I'm going to play the call for you. And I'd like to point out that this is also the bird uh, that's often mistaken for an owl. So if we're listening to this call, it, it does kind of hoot. So that's fair, but this guy is in no way, shape, or form related to owls, whether they are great horned owls, screech owls, or any other sort. Uh, our dove and our morning dove um, is actually named for that call. It sounds like it's kind of mournful. Um, it's a sad sounding s song. Uh, that it uses to communicate to each other. But, once again, not an owl. Not an owl. Not an owl. Um, we, we get a lot of calls about these guys, actually. Um, but they're a bird that's pretty easily overlooked. And that's because, while it does have lots of really fantastic details, including this great iridescent patch um, right on the neck, and, in fact, a blue ring around its eyes, it's something that can be pretty easily dismissed. And I think that's kind of a shame. Now, morning doves are seed eaters. They're going to use that small beak to pick up seeds that they find on the ground and eat them. Uh, those seeds are broken apart in their gizzard. But they're not... Hmm, I have a soft place in my heart for morning doves. Um, they're a really wonderful bird. Um, they've got some great behaviors, and you can see they tend to stick with their mated pair. So you tend to see two morning doves instead of just one. Uh, but they're not a bird that's going to win any academic decathlons. They didn't get the invitation. Um, they weren't told about it because nobody wanted to hurt their feelings. Um, these are birds that, particularly in the springtime, uh, we get contacted about mostly because they've made terrible nesting decisions. Uh, the morning dove is haphazard at best when it comes to building nests. Um, they will take pretty much any spot that is quiet for a day or two. They will throw down a couple of sticks, and by a couple I mean like four, um, and lay their egg on it. Whether they are putting that nest, nest um, in a potted plant that you wanted to water, um, whether they are building it on the slanted windowsill on your fourth story apartment, um, whether they are building it on a table. Um, and they do obviously manage to make some successful nesting decisions. Uh, they're not at all threatened. Uh, they're doing quite well population-wise, uh, but it, it does kind of make you question uh, how they manage to survive to this point, um, particularly with those, those poor decision makings. But uh, they are a great bird to know. Um, we have invasive Eurasian collared doves now, which can look fairly similar. Uh, so it does pay off to pay attention to the details. The fact that this is um, a more brown bird. It's a soft tan, but it is definitely brown. Um, that it does have a dark dot underneath its eye, but that dot is not a collar. And that its tail is pointed in flight. Um, and, you know, they're pretty, but it's a subtle, um, it's a subtle, 
um, prettiness rather than something really flashy or bright colors like things like our house finch or our anna's hummingbird are sporting so this has been birding basics thank you very much for joining at, joining me today i hope you have a wonderful weekend and happy friday